Hello everyone, I am Miss Natalie and this is Read Along from Kalamazoo Public Library. We are reading book three, The Mark of Athena by Rick Riordan, which is part of the Heroes of Olympus series. As always, we're reading on Hoopla, which is a pretty awesome service for e-content like books, movies, music, audiobooks, all kinds of stuff. It's lots of fun. If you are a Kalamazoo Public Library patron, you get 15 borrows from Hoopla a month, which is actually kind of a lot. If you have questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Okay, so, book. Yesterday, when we finished, Leo and Frank had been, well, <laughs> the shrimp zilla thing, which was disgusting, by the by, uh, it knocked Frank into the water, and then Leo managed to get the Greek fire into Shrimpzilla's mouth, but it also, like, threw him and Hazel, and then, before we know it, Frank and Leo are now at the bottom of the ocean, I think, with these fish horse guys. We don't really know exactly what kind of creature they are. The one we met yesterday was called Bithos, and I think, yeah, Bithos, and he was like weird. They're they're interrogating Frank and Leo, and they somehow are able to breathe underwater, and they're fine. But these guys might not be nice. It's really hard to say. So we need to get right to it so that we figure out what is going on. And look, more pictures of six just for you. So, here she is on the left cuddling with me because she's so adorable. And in case you can't tell, she is like super duper soft. And I'm not kidding, guys. So soft. So, anyway, she, uh, yeah, she would like to cuddle with me. And she kind of has this thing about wanting to lie directly on top of me. Which I will totally let her do because she's cute and cuddly and um, she doesn't weigh very much, so I don't mind. And then you see her there on the right. I had gotten a box from the Scholastic Literary Feast filled with a bunch of really cool stuff. But as soon as I brought it home, Six was like, what's in the box? What's in the box? Uh, that's a, a reference for a movie that if you're a child, you should not have seen. So I'll stop doing that. Uh, if you're an adult, that joke was hilarious. Uh, anyway, so, yay, more pictures of my cat. Yay, contact information. Here is my email and my Instagram. Please follow me on Instagram so that we can talk to each other. You'll get to see a lot more pictures of my cat because in the year of our pandemic, pretty much all I do when I'm not working is take pictures of my cat and put them on Instagram now, which I have to say I kind of like. And then, uh, yeah, just like tell me what's going on in the world. Tell me what you've been up to. How did you find our videos? Why do you watch them? Where are you from? Once again, if you're from Kalamazoo, please, please, please tell me that you're from Kalamazoo. We're trying to get the stats uh, for the end of our, uh, I guess I'll call it, business year. And it's really hard because you can't see this kind of stuff on YouTube. But anyway, let's get to the book. Chapter 24, Leo. Aphros looked like his brother, except he was blue instead of green and much, much bigger. He had Arnold as Terminator abs and arms and a square, brutish head. A huge Conan-approved sword was strapped across his back. Even his hair was bigger, a massive globe of blue-black frizz so thick that his lobster claw horns appeared to be drowning as they tried to swim their way to the surface. Is that why they named you Afros? Leo asked as they glided down the path from the cave. Because of the Afro? Afros scowled. What do you mean? Nothing, Leo said quickly. At least he would never have trouble remembering which fish, which fish dude was which. So what are you guys, anyway? Ichthyocentaurs, Afro said, like it was a question he was tired of answering. Uh, icky what? Fish centaurs, 
We are the half-brothers of Chiron. Oh, he's a friend of mine. Aphros narrowed his eyes. The one called Hazel told us this, but we will determine the truth. Come. Leo didn't like the sound of determine the truth. It made him think of torture racks and red-hot pokers. He followed the fish centaur through a massive forest of kelp. Leo could have darted to one side and gotten lost in the plants pretty easily, but he didn't try. For one thing, he figured Aphros could travel much faster in the water, and the guy might be able to shut off the magic that let Leo move and breathe. Inside or outside the cave, Leo was just as much a captive. Also, Leo had no clue where he was. They drifted between rows of kelp as tall as apartment buildings. The green and yellow plants swayed weightlessly, like columns of helium balloons. High above, Leo saw a smudge of white that might have been the sun. He guessed that they'd been here overnight. Was the Argo too alright? Had it sailed on without them, or were their friends still searching? Leo couldn't even be sure how deep they were. Plants could grow here, so not too deep, right? Still, he knew he couldn't just swim for the surface. He'd heard about people who ascended too quickly and developed nitrogen bubbles in their blood. Leo wanted to avoid carbonated blood. They drifted along for maybe half a mile. Leo was tempted to ask where Aphros was taking him, but the big sword strapped to the centaur's back sort of discouraged conversation. Finally, the kelp forest opened up. Leo gasped. They were standing swimming, whatever, at the summit of a high underwater hill. Below them stretched an entire town of Greek-style buildings on the seafloor. The roofs were tiled with mother-of-pearl. The gardens were filled with coral and sea anemones. Hippocampi grazed in a field of seaweed. A team of cyclops was placing the domed roof on a new temple, using a blue whale as a crane. And swimming through the streets, hanging out in the courtyards, Practicing combat with tridents and swords in the arena were dozens of mermen and mermaids. Honest to goodness fish people. Leo had seen a lot of crazy stuff. But he had always thought merpeople were silly fictional creatures, like smurfs or muppets. There was nothing silly or cute about these merpeople, though. Even from a distance, they looked fierce and not at all human. Their eyes glowed yellow. They had shark-like teeth and leathery skin in colors ranging from coral red to ink black. It's a training camp, Leo realized. He looked at Afros in awe. You train heroes, the same way Chiron does? Afros nodded, a glint of pride in his eyes. We have trained all the famous mer-heroes. Name a mer-hero, and we have trained him or her. Oh, sure, Leo said. Like, um... The Little Mermaid? Ephros frowned. Who? No, like Triton, Glaucus, Weissmuller, and Bill. Oh, Leo had no idea who any of those people were. You trained Bill? Impressive. Indeed. Ephros pounded his chest. I trained Bill myself, a great merman. You teach combat, I guess. Ephros threw up his hands in exasperation. Why does everyone assume that? Leo glanced at the massive sword on the fish guy's back. Uh, I don't know. I teach music and poetry, Afro said. Life skills, homemaking. These are important for heroes. Absolutely, Leo tried to keep a straight face. Sewing? Cookie baking? Yes, I'm glad you understand. Perhaps later, if I don't have to kill you, I will share my brownie recipe. Ephros gestured behind him contemptuously. My brother, Bithos. He teaches combat. Leo wasn't sure whether he felt relieved or insulted that the combat trainer was interrogating Frank, while Leo got the home economics teacher. So, great. This is Camp... what do you call it? Camp Fishblood? Ephros frowned. I hope that was a joke. This is Camp... He made a sound that was a series of sonar pings and hisses. Silly me, Leo said. And you know, I could really go for some of those brownies. So what do you, what do we have to do to get to the not killing me stage? Tell me your story, 
Afro said. Leo hesitated, but not for long. Somehow he sensed that he should tell the truth. He started at the beginning. How Hera had been his babysitter and placed him in the flames. How his mother had died because of Gaia, who had identified Leo as a future enemy. He talked about how he had spent his childhood bouncing around in foster homes until he and Jason and Piper had taken, been taken to Camp Half-Blood. He explained the Prophecy of Seven, the building of the Argo II, and their quest to reach Greece and defeat the giants before Gaia woke. As he talked, Aphros drew some wicked-looking metal spikes from his belt. Leo was afraid he had said something wrong, but Aphros pulled some seaweed yarn from his pouch and started knitting. Go on, he urged. Don't stop. By the time Leo had explained the Eidolans, the problem with the Romans, and all the troubles the Argo II had encountered crossing the United States and embarking from Charleston, Aphros had knitted a complete baby bonnet. Leo waited while the fish centaur put away his supplies. Aphros's lobster claw horns kept swimming around in his thick hair, and Leo had to resist the urge to try to rescue them. Very well, Aphros said. I believe you. As simple as that? I am quite good at discerning lies. I hear none from you. Your story also fits with what Hazel Levesque told us. Is she? Of course, Afro said. She's fine. He put his fingers to his mouth and whistled, which sounded strange underwater, like a dolphin screaming. My people will bring her here shortly. You must understand. Our location is a carefully guarded secret. You and your friends showed up in a warship, pursued by one of Keto's sea monsters. We did not know whose side you were on. Is the ship all right? Damaged, Afro said, but not terribly. The Scolopendra withdrew after it got a mouthful of fire. Nice touch. Thank you. Scolopendra? I've never heard of it. Consider yourself lucky. They are nasty creatures. Keto must really hate you. At any rate, we rescued you and the other two from the creature's tentacles as it retreated into the deep. Your friends are still above, searching for you, but we have obscured their vision. We had to be sure you were not a threat. Otherwise, we would have had to take measures. Leo gulped. He was pretty sure taking measures did not mean baking extra brownies. And if these guys were so powerful that they could keep their camp hidden from Percy who had all those Poseidon-ish water powers, they were not fish dudes to mess with. So, we can go? Soon, Aphros promised. I must check with Bithos. When he is done talking with your friend Gank, Frank, Frank, when they are done, we will send you back to your ship, and we may have some warnings for you. Warnings? Ah, Aphros pointed. Hazel emerged from the kelp forest, escorted by two vicious-looking mermaids who were baring their fangs and hissing. Leo thought Hazel might be in danger. Then he saw she was completely at ease, grinning and talking with her escorts, and Leo realized that the mermaids were laughing. Leo! Hazel paddled toward him. Isn't this place amazing? They were left alone at the ridge, which must have meant Aphros really did trust them. While the centaur and the mermaids went off to fetch Frank, Leo and Hazel floated above the hill and gazed down at the underwater camp. Hazel told him how the mermaids had warmed up to her right away. Aphros and Bithos had been fascinated by her story, as they had never met a child of Pluto before. On top of that, they had heard many legends about the Horus Arion, and they were amazed that Hazel had befriended him. Hazel had promised to visit again with Arion. The mermaids had written their phone numbers in waterproof ink on Hazel's arm so that she could keep in touch. Leo didn't even want to ask how mermaids got cell phone coverage in the middle of the Atlantic. As Hazel talked, her hair floated around her face in a cloud, like brown earth and gold dust in a miner's pan. She looked very sure of herself and very beautiful. Not at all like the shy, nervous girl in that New Orleans schoolyard with her smashed canvas lunch bag at her feet. We didn't get to talk, Leo said. He was reluctant to bring up the subject, but 
but he knew this might be their only chance to be alone. I mean about Sammy. Her smile faded. I know. I just need some time to let it sink in. It's strange to think that you and he... She didn't need to finish the thought. Leo, Leo knew exactly how strange it was. I'm not sure I can explain this to Frank, she added, about you and me holding hands. She wouldn't meet Leo's eyes. Down in the valley, the Cyclops' work crew cheered as the temple roof was set in place. I talked to him, Leo said. I told him I wasn't trying to, you know, make trouble between you two. Oh, good. Did she sound disappointed? Leo wasn't sure, and he wasn't sure he wanted to know. Frank, um, seemed pretty freaked out when I mentioned I summoned fire. Leo explained what had happened in the cave. Hazel looked stunned. Oh, no, that would terrify him. Her hand went to her denim jacket, like she was checking for something in the inside pocket. She always wore that jacket, or some sort of overshirt, even when it was hot outside. Leo had assumed that she did it out of modesty, or because it was better for horseback riding, like a motorcycle jacket. Now he began to wonder. His brain shifted into high gear. He remembered what Frank had said about his weakness. A piece of firewood. He thought about why this kid would have a fear of fire, and why Hazel would be so attuned to those feelings. Leo thought about some of the stories he'd heard at Camp Half-Blood. For obvious reasons, he tended to pay attention to legends about fire. Now he remembered one he hadn't thought about in months. There was an old legend about a hero, he recalled. His lifeline was tied to a stick in the fireplace. And when that piece of wood burned up, Hazel's expression turned dark. Leo knew he'd struck on the truth. Frank has that problem, he guessed. And the piece of firewood? He pointed at Hazel's jacket. He gave it to you for safekeeping? Leo, please don't. I can't talk about it. Leo's instincts as a mechanic kicked in. He started thinking about the properties of wood and the corrosiveness of salt water. Is the firewood okay in the ocean like this? Does the layer of air around you protect it? It's fine, Hazel said. The wood didn't even get wet. Besides, it's wrapped up in several layers of cloth and plastic and... She bit her lip in frustration. And I'm not supposed to talk about it. Leo, the point is, if Frank seems afraid of you or uneasy, you've got to understand... Leo was glad he was floating, because he probably would have been too dizzy to stand. He imagined being in Frank's position, his life so fragile, it literally could burn up at any time. He imagined how much trust it would take to give his lifeline, his entire fate, to another person. Frank had chosen Hazel, obviously. So when he had seen Leo, a guy who could summon fire at will, moving in on his girl, Leo shuddered. No wonder Frank didn't like him. And suddenly Frank's ability to turn into a bunch of different animals didn't seem so awesome. Not if it came with a big catch like that. Leo thought about his least favorite line in the Prophecy of Seven. To storm or fire, the world must fall. For a long time, he'd figured that Jason or Percy stood for storm. Maybe both of them together. Leo was the fire guy. Nobody said that but it was pretty clear. Leo was one of the wild cards. If he did the wrong thing, the world could fa fall. No, it must fall. Leo wondered if Frank and his firewood had something to do with that line. Leo had already made some epic mistakes. It would be so easy for him to accidentally send Frank Zhang up in flames. There you are. Bithos' voice made Leo flinch. Bithos and Afros floated over with Frank between them, looking pale, but okay. Frank studied Leo or Hazel and Leo so carefully, as if trying to read what they'd been talking about. You are free to go, Bithos said. He opened his saddlebags and returned their confiscated supplies. 
Leo had never been so glad to fit his tool belt around his waist. Tell Percy Jackson not to worry, Afro said. We have understood your story about the imprisoned sea creatures in Atlanta. Keto and Four Seas must be stopped. We will send a quest of Mer heroes to defeat them and free their captives. Perhaps Cyrus. Or Bill, Bithos offered. Yes, Bill would be perfect, Afros agreed. At any rate, we are grateful that Percy brought this to our attention. You should talk to him in person, Leo suggested. I mean, son of Poseidon and all. Both fish centaurs shook their heads solemnly. Sometimes it is best not to interact with Poseidon's blood, Afro said. We are friendly with the sea god, of course, but the politics of undersea deities is complicated, and we value our independence. Nevertheless, tell Percy thank you. We will do what we can to speed you safely across the Atlantic without further interference from Keto's monsters. But be warned, in the ancient sea, the Mare Nostrum, more dangers await. Frank sighed. Naturally. Bithos clapped the guy on the shoulder. You will be fine, Frank sang. Keep practicing those sea life transformations. The koi fish is good, but try for a Portuguese man of war. Remember what I showed you. It's all in the breathing. Frank looked mortally embarrassed. Leo bit his lip, determined not to smile. And you, Hazel, Afro said. Come visit again and bring that horse of yours. I know you are concerned about the time you lost, spending the night in our realm. You are worried about your brother, Nico. Hazel gripped her cavalry sword. Is he... do you know where he is? Afro shook his head. Not exactly. But when you get closer, you should be able to sense his presence. Never fear. You must reach Rome the day after tomorrow if you are to save him. But there is still time. And you must save him. Yes, Bithos agreed. He will be essential for your journey. I am not sure how, but I sense it is true. Afros planted his hand on Leo's shoulder. As for you, Leo Valdez... Stay close to Hazel and Frank when you reach Rome. I sense they will face, ah, uh, mechanical difficulties that only you can overcome. Mechanical difficulties? Leo asked. Afro smiled as if that was great news. And I have gifts for you, the brave navigator of the Argo too. I like to think of myself as captain, Leo said, or supreme commander. Brownies! Afro said proudly, shoving an old-fashioned picnic basket into Leo's arms. It was surrounded by a bubble of air, which Leo hoped would keep the brownies from turning into saltwater fudge sludge. In this basket, you will also find the recipe. Not too much butter. That's the trick. And I have given you a letter of introduction to Tiberinus, the god of the Tiber River. Once you reach Rome, your friend, the daughter of Athena, will need this. Annabeth. Leo said, okay, but why? Bithos laughed. She follows the mark of Athena, doesn't she? Tiberinus can guide her in this quest. He's an ancient, proud god who can be difficult. But letters of introduction are everything to Roman spirits. This will convince Tiberinus to help her. Hopefully. Hopefully, Leo repeated. Bithos produced three small pink pearls from his saddlebags. And now, off with you, demigods. Good sailing. He threw a pearl at each of them in turn, and three shimmering pink bubbles of energy formed around them. They began to rise through the water. Leo just had time to think, a hamster ball elevator? Then he gained speed and rocketed toward the distant glow of the sun above. <laughs> I just love Leo. He's the best. Okay, everybody have a wonderful, wonderful weekend, and on Monday we'll read chapter 25.